The Years of Decay, Horoscope, I Hear Black, Taking Over, Feel the Fire, just some of the album titles for the band Overkill, and yes, you guessed right, and the new album coming out very soon, Scorched, uh, April 14th, or uh, if you're listening to this or watching this episode after April 14th, that means it's already out and available for everybody to check out. Scorch, the new album from Overkill. And we have Bobby Ellsworth, a.k.a. Blitz, as our guest for this episode of That Metal Interview Podcast. And thank you guys and girls for joining me one more time on this rock metal journey through life. And right now, let's check out the second single and lyric video for Overkill with the title of Wicked Place. We'll be right back with our interview and chat with Bobby Ellsworth Blitz. Check it out.
-hmm. Melted face once more. Wicked place. Automatic face melt for sure. Overkill kills it as always and every time. Dee Dee Verney on the bass. Bobby Blitz Ellsworth on the vocals. Dave Linsk and Derek Taylor on the guitars. And the sensational Jason Bittner on the drums. As we had him on the show too. Big shout out to the Overkill camp. And the big congrats to the guys from Overkill for bringing the kill once more. Great album, Scorched. You guys are going to love it. Uh, this is Wicked Place. And let's go straight into the chat with Bobby Blitz of Overkill. Enjoy. Where you at anyway, so I know. I'm in Texas, uh, very close to San Antonio. Oh, very nice. The last time I played there, I think, was the Aztec down on the Riverwalk. Oh, yeah, yeah. How was that? How was that show? What a great, what a great venue, great area. Yeah. How was that turnout? Great. It was good. Yeah, it was good. I mean, it wasn't full, but I mean, I guess there was probably eight, 900 people. Great crowd right there. So how was the weather up in uh, your area? Well, spring's coming, which is nice. You know, the crocus has popped out and the uh, snow's gone. It was actually a pretty mild pretty mild winter. Um, but I mean, you see guys out in motorcycles already, you know, bikes. And, you know, the roads are a little shitty from the from all the gravel that they put on it when it gets icy and shit up here. But, I mean, it's it's making its turn right now. You can see that Mother Nature's kind of smiling on the whole area. <laughs> the flowers have pop up. So, nice. kind of an exciting. Um, and besides that, I mean, we're getting ready to go on the road. So spring tours are always a lot more fun than going out in the winter. For yeah, sure. Just because they're just that much more comfortable. You spend more time outside, you know? Yeah. So um, I first heard of Overkill on MTV, Headbangers Ball, uh, around 87 when I was in school. So I saw the video for In Uni We Stand, bought the cassette, became a fan. Uh, so thank you for providing some badass metal. Thank you. Hey, right on, bro. I mean, that's like, I mean, that's a long time ago. I mean, we're talking... <laughs> the band's first release was 38 years ago, so that's that's 36 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Times, so, right? Yeah. So we're here to speak about uh, Scorched uh, dropping April 14th. Can you talk about the record, uh, riffs, lyrics? Uh, who who's in charge of that? And well, sure. I mean, it's you know, it's it usually starts with my partner Didi. I mean, he's really the he's kind of the riff meister here. Yeah. You know, it's. Uh, uh, so the, the origin of the idea or the direction of the record with regard to riff starts with him. And I think one of the unique things about this record um, is that it is, it's a series of riffs. Um, it's not a riff and a secondary riff. Uh, if you listen to the first single we released, which is called The Surgeon. probably yeah. count five or six different riffs uh, within that within that tune. And I think that the you know the key to success with something like that is stowing those riffs together seamlessly. You know, sure you want every now and then you want one to drop off a cliff into a center section where you're breaking into a halftime part. But I think the success of this record is uh, the culmination of all these riffs that are in many cases just seamless. So starting with Didi and ending with me where I kind of put, like if it was a house, he's the foundation of it, and I'm putting the roof on it. Yeah. But it goes through, it goes through everybody uh, to, till we get to that part, because you can't stop a guy like Jason Bittner on, on drums uh, from writing his own parts. You can suggest things, but he's got to, you know, he's got to have input to be interested. And the same with Dave Lintz. You know, Dave and I work a lot when it comes to melodies. You know, we go back and forth. He's like, what do you got for this? What do you have for going home? What do you have for Scorch? What do you have for wicked place and I, you know I'll send him something he'll send me something back so it becomes uh, a group effort but again starting with Dee, Dee ending with myself and I think on this record specifically if I had to look for a characteristic yeah. uh, I can't I can't put my hand or my finger on one because it has many it's not just a thrash record it's not just a metal record it's got rock and roll it's got traditional heavy metal it's got progressive thrash it's got thrash it's got groove etc so I think that somewhere in there, what made it interesting for us was that we were kind of all over the map, but to, to some degree got to the, the, the outcome is an overkill record, not yeah. just a collection of different songs. Yeah, awesome stuff. I got to hear the whole record. It's just killer. You guys killed it. Awesome. So um, after 40 years or for sure over 40 years, do you still have a hard time coming up with lyrics or ideas or how did that go for you? Well, you know, the, I always... 
you know, there's always a pool that you choose from. You know, there's like, there's kind of a go-to place when it comes to lyrics, I think, when you've been doing it as long as I have. But I think more in terms of melody before I think in terms of lyrics. Like, the, the topic will eventually come to me. The, the, the song that speaks to you musically sometimes when, uh, or speaks to you lyrically without uh, lyrics there. And what I'll do is I use phonetics just to fill in those spaces and figure out my melody. But eventually I start singing something to it that's lyrical. And I always think that if I'm doing that subconsciously or unconsciously, that that's the direction it should go in. Now, for some reason, whatever I'm singing subconsciously to those phonetics is usually something that I've experienced since the last record. But yeah. then I go back to that that I spoke of and say, okay, how do I expand upon it from here? So it's not as if there's um, it's not as if there's a lack of idea, but yeah. it's a very fine line between plagiarizing yourself, um, you know, repetition as opposed to style. Let's yeah. say. So by going to that pool can be dangerous um, if you start if you start plagiarizing yourself or repeating yourself. Would you say this record sounds like uh, The Wings of War, or do you think it's uh, a bit different? Oh, I think it's a, I think it's a big difference. I mean, with regard to everything, songwriting, production, um, you know, the production is not as it's heavy, but it's not a tiring production. I mean, there's sometimes you can put on, you know, a metal record and it can wear your ears out, in, you know, three or four or five songs, you know, you yeah. actually need a break to. Um, it was one of the things we conveyed to Colin Richardson when he was mixing the record, Colin and his partner, Chris Clancy was that we want a record that you can listen to loud um, for its entirety. Not something that's going to tire your ears out. And yeah. that's about, you know, over-compressed shit. And, uh, you know, this this record breathes a little bit more. So it's not exactly like the Wings of War, let's say, in that aspect. Yeah. Um, when it comes to songwriting, I think it's a little bit different too. And I, and I mentioned that with regard to whether it be rock and roll or groove. I mean, you listen to a song like Twist of the Wick, you know, and it's... It's got this kind of thrash element that almost goes into blast beats on the drums, but a traditional metal kind of a chorus. And then you go into Wicked Place, and it's this old kind of blues ride. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. blues ride on stacks. So if you can get those kind of dynamics in a record, I mean, for us doing it anyway, our feeling is if you can, if we can apply those dynamics to a record, that we've succeeded by showing more than just one influence that we've had over the years. But we've been influenced by hard rock and traditional metal as well as kind of progressive thrash so what's your favorite song on scorched that's always hard to say man i mean you know it bounces around all the time i was um i was really partial to fever uh for a long time just because of its the the difference in it and how yeah. uh, the mellow part was sewn together with that big heavy you know kind of gargantuan you know godzilla kind of a riff you know um but then i, I started getting into twist of the whip because I mean, I never saw Twist of the Wick come together in my head. I, I thought, when I when I did my parts to that, uh, melodically, and wrote the lyrics, etc., I, I thought I kind of, I missed the mark on it. I was like, oh, fuck. I came so close with this. But then as, it, as it started becoming mixed, and I started hearing it more and more with the traditional kind of a heavy metal chorus, and that progressive thrash being married to it, uh, became one of my favorite songs, and probably right now is. Just because of its um, the dynamics in it, or the contrast between the chorus and the verse, or the you know the beat in yeah. the, the verse as opposed to the beat in the chorus, I think it's uh, I think it's kind of a unique song. What's your favorite song to sing live out of all the the songs? Out of everything we've done, or just this record? Everything. Oh jeez, I mean that's kind of hard, man. We've done like two. This is a 20th record, so it's yeah. always been ten. It's 200 songs. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you this, some of them I'm fucking sick of. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Like, if I never see that song again, it'll be too fucking soon. Um, <laughs> I'm partial to a, it's a uh, kind of a swinging uh, number from the uh, 90s. It came out in 97 on the underground and below. Um, well, from the underground and below. But the song is um, called Long Time Dying. Oh yeah, and it's just uh, there's there's personal reasons why I like it, and it, it's also I just like that swinging back and forth kind of a vibe 
uh, in that. Uh, the, I think the guitar works great. It's also another Colin Richardson production. Um, so, he, you know, he's worked with us on four records to this point. Uh, four of our 20 are Colin products. So, I mean, that's that's really kind of cool. But I, I just like the way that that sits in there um, amongst the thrash. It's just more of a groovy tune. And it's, um, I like dynamics. And that, that one's uh, really fun to sing for me. Yeah, it's a badass song. Yeah, uh, how about uh, you mentioned you're sick of uh, singing certain songs. Which one is that? Elimination or, or? Well, sure. I mean, Elimination, I've done it. I mean, I must have done it, you know, Maybe. 1,500 or more times, yeah. you know. I mean, I, I, it's got to be more than that. Probably more like 3,000. And mm-hmm. Rotten to the Core, I've probably done more like you know, 3,500. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's off the first record, Rotten to the Core. It's been in the set almost every every time. If you think that we have 20 records and we've done 100 shows for each record, yeah. it's at least a minimum of 2,000 shows, right? I mean, it's... Wow. You know, so, I mean, you know, plus all the other fucking shows that, I guess it's probably 2,000 or 2,500 shows we've done. But the but the point being is that, you know, the newer songs are the ones that really pique my interest because it's, they still have that element of danger to them. Yeah. You know, when you're doing something based on repetition, sure, it's great that people love the song, don't get me wrong. But the danger part is the fun part of being on a stage. You know, not a hundred percent sure, knowing that the song is going to go over. You, you, you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. kind of like that. I like that kind of a feel when you when you go when you walk out on the stage, and that's only that only can be brought by a new song. Yep, agreed. Uh, so you were there at the beginning, at the inception of thrash metal. How does that feel? I mean, you were there at the when it was born. You know, in the eighties. Well, I guess you know. I mean, these bands that precede us. This is, you know, an ongoing argument that I think some people have, uh, and I only find out about it when we're doing interviews. It's like, oh, you guys preceded Metallica. I'm like, you know, that may be true with regard to time, but it, it was has nothing to do with, with regard to the music being released. I mean, they released before us. So it's just as simple as it is. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, and, and when they when they released, not even the demo, their demo made made some noise. Uh, but when they released Kill em All, I mean, it changed the fucking whole playing field. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, everything was different after that. And we were nowhere near ready to release a record at that point. So sure, we were at the beginning of it, but we were kind of a cover band that was developing. You know, so I, I always think that the cool thing about, let's say, that bands on the West Coast, uh, or bands on the East Coast, or bands in Texas, or bands in Germany, or the UK, was that we were all kind of developing simultaneously um, in the same genre without having social media, without having instantaneous information, you know, where we could, you know, you could FaceTime somebody or you could send a text. You yeah. send a fucking letter you had to fucking make a phone call. Yeah. You know, so in the West Coast, we're listening to that West Coast punk and, you know, the new wave of British heavy metal and we were listening to traditional metal on the East Coast and, and East Coast punk, but we're still developing simultaneously. Um, so I always thought that that was the most interesting part about being there at the beginning was that uh, regardless of not having instant information, there was still a similar idea, uh, a thread that was traveling around the world with regard to developing in different places. Do you think you should have been there with the big four instead of Anthrax? How do you feel about that? No, I don't. I don't. I don't live in that world. I mean, that's like. I mean, for me, bro. I mean, I've lived my fucking life, you know, in motorcycle boots and Levi's. Yeah. I mean, it's fucking enough for me. <laughs> I like, I like the way I live. You know, I don't need that big responsibility, and I don't need people to give me fucking parades. You know, I yeah. mean, it's, it's, I cut my own fucking grass and change my oil on my own bike. <laughs> you know, you know, so yeah. Kind of cat I am. You know what I mean? I drink cheap beer. <laughs> and I like girls. <laughs> yep, same here. I don't need to pay the big four. But I, I I think that, you know, with that being said, I think I'm blessed to be a part of this scene because, you know, it's like I like hanging out with people who are a lot like me. And I mean, talking to you, you're to some degree, you're a lot like me. We like a lot of the same shit, yeah. this music, you know? So it's kind of, I think of it more in those terms than anything else to be able to go through you know, a life and, and, and say, you know, oh, how were you blessed? I was blessed financially. How were you blessed? I have a fucking 100,000 friends who think exactly the way I do. I'd rather have the B, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> friends. So, so I'm a happy man. I don't need to be, uh, I don't need to compare myself to uh, anybody in the big four. Awesome. Good answer. 
Uh, I think, my opinion, my two cents, you guys should have been there instead of Anthrax, but that's just my two cents. Yeah. You look at it from a man equation, they sell a lot more records. And I think that that's a great thing that they've done uh, with regard to being able to help bands like ourselves uh, get more attention, keep our, you know, keep our train rolling, you mm-hmm. know, to give, you know, fuel to the fire kind of a thing. Yeah. So if they're bringing attention to that whole, you know, big four kind of a thing, it only helps, it only helps overkill. Yeah. And I, I, I told a story the other day about, you know, it was like 2006 and Dave Mustang gave me a call and he's like, hey, I'm, I'm taking out Gigantor next year. I want you to come along. You know, it'd be great to fucking hook up again. And I, and, and he was, he said, all I want from me is like some promotion from your record company. But we were hanging in the balance at the time. There was some shit changing and it looked like we were going to have to look for a new deal. And I said, sure, I'll do that. Well, in any case, you know, we got out there on the fucking road. And by the time we got home from that Gigantor, we had three or four deals that were offered to us. Nice. You know, again, at that point. So, I mean, listen, this guy didn't have to do this. He did this because he's buddy. You know what I'm saying? And he brought us back out in the fucking road with him. We got this great amount of exposure. And then I'm not going to say he rejuvenated the career. We would have gotten something anyway. But I think it brought us to, uh, it put us in the public eye with regard to uh, a higher esteem. For what our value was, yeah, and you know, I mean, it's like you know, you can only get that kind of shit from from people who like you, or love you, you know. So, well, no. so I was I was thinking as being like a you know a, a really kind of cool point in our career that you know it was kind of like a reboot, you know, when it came to uh, when it came to a new deal. Wow, how cool! That was pretty cool, Mustang. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you're about to hit the road here, a European tour with Exhorter and Heathen. Are you guys excited? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a nice underground tour, you know. I mean, we've done tours with both of these bands. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, Heathen with us uh, back on our Ironbound record. Um, we took them to Europe with us on their kind of, you know, welcome back to the to the touring world cycle back in, I think, I guess it was 2010 or 11. Um, it's Horder we were on the road with when the, when the pandemic shut everything down. Uh, so, you know, March 2020 was our, our last show. March 12th was our last show with It's Horder. Um, on that tour, so we're familiar with both bands. We think they both have a lot to offer. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. At us, whole package. It's going to be, geez, man. It's going to be like, uh, you know, it's going to be like a, a three prong attack. You yeah. Know? I, I mean, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a great tour. I mean, everybody's got some great tunes. We got the, you know, the entire Scorch record. You know, uh, you know, waiting on leash three or four of those tunes. So I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be something great. So how do you go about making a set list, uh, Bobby? You have so many badass songs and records, and how do you guys go about that? Of course, you got to do a couple of new tracks and and the, the the must play songs like Elimination, I guess. How do you guys go about that? Well, I tell you, you know, I mean, I, I said it before, you know, the, the the most important part of it to me is playing the the newer tunes. I mean, that's what's exciting. Um, like, you know, we're not dopes. We understand that there has to be a classical or classic vibe to the whole thing too. Where there's going to be maybe four, you know, a rock to the core, maybe a horror scope, uh, elimination. Fuck you's going to be in there, obviously. Um, but then the rest, we, we kind of like to slide them in and out um, and see what's happened with regard to their popularity over the years. I mean, there's a song off of the grinding wheel called Mean Green Killing Machine. try not to hurt myself but i don't worry about it i, I just don't want to worry about it it would, it would just it wouldn't it would make it less enjoyable put it that way now here's a different question uh do you keep in touch in contact with uh former band members maybe like rat skates or sid kind of you know yeah, sid, sid and i talk we just talked yesterday sid's doing some new music yeah he always oh, yeah. bounced it off of me um his infectious 13 stuff he sent to me you know as soon as he had it i mean i mean i like sid we, you know when he stopped playing he became an over-the-road driver uh, truck driver and you know I mean I'd be like I remember being at oh god the bomb factory in Dallas you know yeah. and I'm, you know and I'm, I'm standing in a parking lot and this guy pulls in with a fucking pulls in with a fucking tractor you know <laughs> and no trailer in the back it's like it's fucking Sid right <laughs> <laughs> like look at this son of a bitch you know so uh, Canavino's in touch with us I, I really don't talk to Rat um, Bobby and I don't talk anymore um, I talk to Joe Camo. Because uh, recently Sebastian Marino died. Yeah. Uh, 
here in the 90s of ours. Uh, so, you know, it's on and off. I, I, I guess half of them I'm in touch with. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, can you give us an update on The Cursed? Is that done with? Is that over? Well, if it's up to Dan Lorenzo, no. You know, because he wants to continuously release, you know, new tracks. I mean, that guy is just, I mean, he's one of the most unique players I've ever played with. He can actually think a riff and then play it instantly. He doesn't have to find it on the on the fretboard, you know. Um, he, he's thought the riff out and then he plays it. And that's why I think he can do so much music, you know. But yeah. uh, for me, I, I would do another cursed record, but it would have to be a cursed record uh, under uh, the umbrella of a label. I don't want to just do another record that, you know, is like, okay, let's go out and search this deal. Let's go release it on our own. Yeah. You know, that type of thing. And I think that that's the way music is heading in this particular, at this particular time. Um, that it's cheaper to make a good sounding record. So, you know, guys will make that good sounding record and put it out on their own in many cases, you know? Yeah. But I always like the protection and the promotion of a label because I think that without it, um, a project can become lost very easily among all the projects that are out there. Understood. Uh, how about an update on BPMD? Well, sure. We're, I mean, we're in touch all the time. Um, I can tell you this. Uh, we're messing around with some stuff and some ideas. Nice. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a fun little project because... You know, Mark and I get along great. Um, I've known Mike Portnoy forever, and Phil, Phil Demo and I met um, through uh, Metal Allegiance, which Mark brought me into to you know to help out. And I only I only did Metal Allegiance to give Mark a pain in the ass. You know what I'm saying? Because he's just he's just a smart ass. I'm a smart ass. It's just that kind of a <laughs> beer drinking weekend. You know, and the next thing I know, I'm involved in the whole thing. But it's because of the personalities work, and yeah. very much the same. BPMD, you know, they're just dudes I've known for, like Mike I've known forever. Mike filled in for some overkill shows okay. in the past. Played yeah. with us at fucking Sweden Rock. He was standing on the side of the stage in Sweden, drumsticks in his pocket going, can I play? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, sure, bro. I mean, ask the drummer. <laughs> no, ask me. I know you know the songs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's ready to go, yeah. So, uh, yeah, he is. So what can fans in Mexico or South America expect overkill? Jeez, you know, we're talking about the South American thing. We got a guy down there who does, um, he puts full tours together uh, through individual promoters, which is the easiest way to do it because he can get the whole thing. Uh, we would probably be ready for something like that in uh, the South American su um, summer or, or spring, which would be our, like, November. Um, but Mexico, we always pop in and out of, especially for specialty shows. I think the last time we were there was... Uh, Candelabrum uh, Fest, um, which was just awesome. We had done it with, um, oh God, who was on that? Um, the, uh, the band from Portugal, um, Moonspell. Moonspell. Moonspell was in a mass um, carcass. So it was like, you know, it was a really, it was a really cool, um, it was a really cool, uh, cool fest. And that was, that was last September. So, I mean, hopefully we can be at, um, you know, Hell in Heaven and, um, you know, in the upcoming, and do a few shows over over the border. You know, a Tijuana or, or you know a Monterey. It always depends on always depends on the uh, uh, the political climate too. Put it that way. Okay, cool, awesome. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Thank you for your time. And uh, would you like to send a message to your fans listening to this podcast? Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll see you on the road somewhere. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna happen in the states probably uh, early summer. So uh, keep your eyes open. Stay scorched. Be safe. See you on the road. Awesome. Thank you, Bobby. Thanks for the great music. That's it. All right, bro. What a cool guy. What a cool guy. Blitz, thank you for making time and thank you for chatting with that metal interview. And uh, to all the fanatics that were waiting for that interview, there you go. You heard it straight from Mr. Bobby Ellsworth. The present update and the future of Overkill. And uh, as he speaks and reveals his favorite track on the new album, Scorched. And don't forget to support them on tour. Uh, go and purchase merchandise. Go to the go to their merch table. If you don't have enough money at the gig to do that, uh, you can also uh, log on to their website. Uh, look them up on social media. I believe their website is wreckingcrew.com. And uh, you can find them on social media, as I said before, Overkill. And thank you guys and girls for making our podcast one of the best podcasts in the world. 
and the fastest rising rock metal podcast. I'm not sure if it's the best one, but it is to me. So anyways, thank you guys. And uh, stay tuned for other rock metal artists. If you guys uh, want to hear a certain interview or you want me to pursue and find a certain artist for me to interview, uh, go ahead and do so. Write to me, inbox me on any of our social media uh, sites, uh, whether it be Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, on the YouTube videos or wherever. Just uh, find me there, James, and uh, just put there, can you interview so-and-so and can you ask him or her so-and-so. So anyways, don't forget to keep it metal. <laughs> Metal Interview.